All right, we're down again after the biggest drop in live trading since August 5th yesterday, 30 minutes until the start of trading. Today, I'm Matt Miller. I'm Shanali Bassett. And I'm Katie Greifeld. Bloomberg Open Interest starts right now. And coming up, chips are down. A global fight from risk assets continues as NVIDIA suffers a record route. Meanwhile, Intel's money troubles may soon be a political liability. Details ahead on what this means for America's so-called chip-making renaissance. And going private, the Nordstrom family offers to buy its namesake department store chain for nearly $4 billion. All that and more coming up, but let's take a look at where markets are trading after a brutal start to September yesterday. No relief bounce right now. The S&P 500 down about three-tenths of a percent pre-market. Once again, it is big tech that is the biggest loser here. The Nasdaq 100 down half a percent pre-market. The bond market pretty quiet. We did see a big haven bid bring yields lower yesterday, but right now the 10-year yield, I would go ahead and call that unchanged, Matt. All right, we're waiting for the Jolts job openings number. Last month, they were more than 8 million, more than 1.2 jobs for every job seeker out there. But we've seen a divergence here in the blue line. Uh, you see U.S. job openings. The white line is the S&P. And you can see that even though job openings have come down, the S&P, the stock market continues to rally. Let's look at some stocks under the hood before the market opens as well. We mentioned NVIDIA. As sources tell Bloomberg, there are concerns that the company is making it harder to switch to other suppliers and penalizes buyers that don't exclusively use its artificial intelligence chips. And on the heels of that report, after a record route, you have NVIDIA down another 1.1%. And the Nordstrom founding family has offered to buy the retailer for $23 per share in a cash deal, implying an equity value of $3.8 billion. But Nordstrom is down about less than one point, uh, one tenth of one percent here, roughly flat on the day. Remember, the offer mat is just about the average of the five year of uh, trading averages here, Matt. We'll see how the market reacts once the market opens. Yeah, seven cents or a third of one uh, percent. Really, though, it's NVIDIA that has to be the focus of the market. Yesterday, down 10 percent, um, even before we got news that the antitrust of the antitrust probe, uh, Bloomberg Intelligence antitrust uh, litigation and policy analyst Justin Teresi joins us now. So I guess there's a couple of issues here, Justin. Um, first of all, the huge drop. They were literally decimated in yesterday's trade. And then after that, we got this antitrust probe. Did people know? Was there a leak so, before uh, the announcement? So a busy day for sure, I'd say for NVIDIA. But what's really important to remember here is that news broke a couple months ago that DOJ was already starting a probe into NVIDIA on a series of antitrust concerns. So it's this next step here, the issuance of, of a subpoena, in many ways, that was really expected. All that had happened before is that informal inquiries were issued that didn't really have the force of law behind them. So what this does is guarantees now that NVIDIA, in complying with the subpoena, which will take quite some time, I should add, what that's going to do is, is NVIDIA is going to have to certify, basically, that what they're producing and handing over to DOJ is the kit and caboodle of what they're asking about. And so I'm curious about how this wraps into sort of the U.S.'s geopolitical ambitions sure. when it comes to the chip industry, because NVIDIA is the global leader in chip making. And you have to think that the United States wants it to keep that position. Well, that is certainly the argument you're hearing from some folks on Capitol Hill right now with regard to the antitrust concerns that we're, that we're looking well, at. Well, we should also point out NVIDIA doesn't make chips, right? NVIDIA gives their designs to TSMC to make chips well, mm -hmm. in be, Taiwan. Be that as it may, we're seeing yeah. acquisitions by NVIDIA now, right, where this issue of consolidation in that space is raising some red flags. But to your point, too, about global dominance, we're seeing investigations of NVIDIA by several authorities around the world. The most stark maybe being the French raid of a NVIDIA office last fall, which was followed up with news last month that charges are likely to happen there in France. So it's not isolated to America. We're seeing this around the world. 
And really, this issue of dominance is one that some folks are actually saying is a fallacy in the AI space. But NVIDIA is so far ahead of the pack at this point. How much are these allegations, or even the probe itself, really something that would lead to more of a slap on the wrist rather than a dire outcome? Right. So it's impossible just yet to know exactly where DOJ is going. We're getting these mini leaks, if you will, the last few months, right? So what we know so far is that consolidation of the industry might be one issue they're curious about, but another might be things like tying products together, forcing customers perhaps to buy two products instead of one. In order to get the services of one product, you have to buy both of them. Those are things that can raise an anti-competitive flag when somebody has an extreme market domination position. So that, that's something we think authorities are looking into. But we're years away, I think, from any structural behavioral changes that we're likely to see at the hands of this investigation. It's going to take a long time for DOJ to get through these documents that they're going to get from the subpoena. Justin, we thank you so much for your time. Bloomberg Intelligence Antitrust Litigation and Policy Analyst Justin Teresi. We're going to check here on futures because, of course, we had a brutal day in markets yesterday, resuming those declines today with S&P futures down about three-tenths of one percent and NASDAQ 100 futures down another six-tenths of one percent. The VIX remains elevated at a 22 handle. And it's interesting, Katie, if we talk about that daisy chain of events, as you like to talk about, you started the week, really, the trading week here in the U.S with hawkish comments over in Japan by the Bank of Japan governor, really setting off a risk-off attitude in mm -hmm. assets, maybe an extension of that carry trade unwind. And then really that ISM data coming in softer than expen uh, expected, setting off the markets even more yesterday downward, right. a record route in NVIDIA only to lead to the end of the day that DOJ news that came after right. the market closed. I heard a quote on radio this morning that I think really nicely synthesizes the mood music right now. Quincy Crosby saying that this is the kind of market where everyone turns into a technician. I mean, we're all searching for answers here. Now we're talking about RSIs. We're talking about support levels. We were talking about death crosses and golden crosses <laughs> in our morning meeting. I mean, at the end of the day, who really knows? There are so many different cross currents in this market right now. Yeah, and it does seem like a lot of noise to me. Let's bring in uh, someone who... Um, strategizes about equities for a living. Stuart Kaiser joins us. He is Citi's head of U.S. equity trading strategy. I want to start with the, the yen carry trade. I mean, how much of this is really noise? Because it gets put on and then it's unwound, we're told, but you can't really gauge how big it is. Now I guess it's been put on again. Um, can you use it to your advantage? I mean, you know, our view on yen carry trade is it may be disruptive a bit. We don't think there's a whole lot of direct equity ownership, you know, coming through the yen carry trade. So this is much more of a spillover issue. You know, other assets start to move. You get volatility in the markets and equities kind of pick up on that. It's funny, you know, a couple weeks ago, everybody was saying, oh, the yen carry trade is totally unwound and we don't need to worry about it anymore. You know, our view is that's not the case. You know, this is a trade that's accumulated over multiple years. You don't rebalance that in two weeks. So it is something that's going to be in the background and, and people are very attentive to it at the moment. So is it not really a tempest in the teapot, is it more so kind of this slow bleed that's under the market? I guess it depends how quick people decide to get out of it. Um, <laughs> look, I think it's uh, when the end carry trade is something most equity investors would not have even you know discussed six months ago. Mm -hmm. So to your, to your point, people are looking for signals, looking for where true north is when you have kind of volatile markets, and that's that's one thing to kind of focus on. I think you know the the area I'd be more concerned about, frankly, is what's going on with the Nikkei. You know, the Nikkei has been a very very popular long trade for a lot of investors for a period of time. The BOJ seems to have disrupted that. That's not directly the yen carry trade, but it is sort of a global equity market that's under a lot of pressure. And when you get volatility shocks in one region, those things impact global portfolios and, and tend to impact other markets as well. So respect, of course, the unwind of that yen carry trade. To your point, this is something that accumulated over years. It's probably going to take more than a couple of weeks for it to be unwound. Let's talk about sort of the spillover into U.S. equity markets, though, because there was some really fascinating trading going on with the VIX. Uh, right now, you take a look at the VIX trading with a 22 handle on its way to 23. We're not exactly in the 60s like we were a month ago, but how are you reading that real jump in volatility that we've seen? Yeah, look, I think you came into the it came into September with basically all time high U.S. equity markets in immense, immensely important catalyst at the end of the week, really bad September seasonals. And then you got some kind of weaker growth data. And I think the combination of that has gotten people to kind of de-risk portfolios. You know, the VIX moving to 22, not that surprising given the given the type of move you had in the S&P. The VIX, which is the implied volatility on those VIX options, has moved significantly higher. And I think uh, for trading desks, that's, that's got a lot of people's attention because that's kind of what 
was a symptom of the sell-off in early August. It's clearly not completely resolved itself as much as people would like it to have, have, have done. So look, you have a combination of some, some growth impact, which impact the cyclical sectors, and then you have a positioning impact, which is affecting the VIX and the tech sector in particular. And you know, we're just gonna have to deal with it because there's not really a compelling reason to add risk right now ahead of that payroll sprint. But the, what's the compelling reason to, to sell off stocks? at the pace that we saw yesterday. I mean, heard someone say it was growth concerns, but didn't we just get a GDP print at 3%? I mean, as inflation is down at, you know, two and a half, um, unemployment is still at 4.3. I mean, these are all great compared to historic averages. So is there a real growth concern? Yeah, there is. Look, I think the- With the, earnings up 11%, with sales up five and change? I mean- He's I, the bull on the desk. Look, those are, th those are all positive things, that, and I, I don't argue with it, but I would say you've transitioned the macro trading environment over the last month or two. You were in a higher for longer environment where U.S. economic data was surprising to the upside, rate cuts were being priced out, and equity markets were being pushed higher. That changed at the end of June and into early July where economic data is now surprising to the downside. So the market isn't trading higher for longer right now. They're trading a slow and growth environment. And when you're trading a slow and growth environment, the risk reward is very poor because you get near these borderlines where it could be hard landing, it could be soft landing. And I think what that means is growth data like the ISM becomes more impactful than it has been. We used to trade the ISM, and then for two years we stopped trading it because we were so worried about inflation. I think what the market's telling you is in this slow and growth environment, every growth data point just carries more importance, particularly with with equities at all-time highs, valuation stretched, and payrolls on Friday. So I think it's the compelling reason to sell was risk reward isn't great. We were at an all-time high, and, and people felt the need to de-risk ahead of what could be kind of a market-changing catalyst on Friday. What's more is to use an analogy here. If you're cooking and you hold on to a cast iron pan with empty hands, with no, with no really pot holders, you can't pick up the pan again. And is that what we saw in August, where the way people were positioned were, they got burned, they got burned, they can't, really participate in this market as it draws down. Uh, look, I, people definitely got hurt in early August when you have that kind of VAR shock go through the system. I think also kind of what happened is you had some risk put back on at the end of August. That's why you got back to all-time highs, right? But people were being very selective and cautious with that risk because they knew what was to come in, in September, which is payrolls, which is FOMC, which is a, a, a very important debate and another CPI print. So I think as much as people might have wanted to put some more risk on, to your point, A, they had had a VAR shock, which hurt their portfolios, and B, People looked a month ahead and said, what's the point? <laughs> so if you're going to make a bullish bet on the market, say you look a month or two out, if you want to play it through the options market, how fast do you have to, how far do you have to look out before you really materialize those returns? I look, I think if you're, if you're buying options now for a bullish view, you're probably looking at a three-month sort of 25 delta call type situation. It's very hard to trade anything sub a month if you actually have a structural bullish view here because there's just way too much kind of a vet risk, you know, layered into the system right now. Will people be willing to do that? It remains to be seen. There is a bull case there. You know, to Matt's point, there is a lot of strong economic data. Earnings were pretty positive. If, let's say we print on the consensus on Friday, which is 165K, if you print 165 and the Fed still does a 25 basis point insurance cut, there is a good case there that you should be long equities and long small cap in that environment. The problem is if you print 125K, it's the exact opposite trade. And it's that sort of dichotomy in the markets right now, which I think is keeping risk takers very cautious. Well, looking at the here and now, I mean, to follow up on Chanali's burning metaphor, uh, I'm trying to one up that and I can't, but you saw a lot of people get flushed out, I assume, in August. What does the state of positioning look like right now? If you take a peek into the options market, into the derivative space, what does sentiment actually look for like right now as we skate into some of those risk events? Yeah, look, a lot of it changed yesterday. You know, if you were coming into September, you would have said, you know, vol looks pretty low, skew isn't too elevated. It's a modestly bullish kind of setup in equities. Uh, you know, when you move the VIX six, eight points higher in a day, you put the VIX back to 130, and you kind of, you know, jam skew a little bit higher as well. Right now, it's going to look tactically conservative. Right. And, and that's appropriate, I think. I, I think the market is right now trading event to event over the course of the ne every week, the next three weeks, you have what you would consider a really important macro event. I think the market's going to have to trade that. So where is sentiment? I, I think a lot of risk got taken off in early August. As I mentioned, some got built back, but it got built back in a very conservative way. So I think right now it's it's it's. You know, trust but verify. You know, you have some risk on, but you're being super, super careful about it, and you have to be really, really um, aware of where the landmines are. All right, Stuart, so great to have you Thank on you. a week like this one. The VIX right now camped out at 22 and a half. That, of course, is City Head of U.S. Equity Trading Strategy, Stuart Kaiser.
Now, coming up, Intel's financial struggles could be a major setback for the U.S. chip-making renaissance. We'll discuss that and, of course, how it fits into the U.S. policy scene with Libby Cantrell. She is PIMCO head of public policy, joining us next to discuss. This is Bloomberg. Let's get out of high interest to look at what's making headlines around the world. Blackstone has agreed to buy Air Trunk, an Australian data center, center operator, at a valuation of just over $16 billion. The deal would be Blackstone's biggest ever investment in the Asia Pacific re region, and it includes debt and capital expenditures for committed products. The transaction is pending regulatory approval. U.S. Steel's CEO, David Burrett, said, the company would close steel mills and move its headquarters out of Pittsburgh if its planned sale to Nippon Steel collapses. That's according to the Wall Street Journal. Burrett said that the Japan-based company's nearly $3 billion in investment in U.S. Steel's older mills is critical to keeping them competitive. Those comments come after Vice President Kamala Harris earlier this week joined President Biden in declaring that the United States uh, U.S. Steel should remain domestically owned and operated, and obviously Trump thinks the same thing. Now, the government's bet that Intel will lead a U.S. chip-making renaissance, as in actually making those chips, is in grave trouble thanks to Intel's mounting financial struggles. Five months after the president traveled to Arizona to unveil a potential $20 billion package of incentives, there are growing questions around when or even if Intel will get its hands on that money. Katie? Let's keep the conversation going now with Libby Cantrell. She is PIMCO's head of U.S. public policy. Joining us now on set, great to see you in person. Nice to see you. So building off that Intel conversation, I mean, it just feels like the U.S. government was taking victory laps on this. This was supposed to be a big lifeline for Intel. Now there's questions as to whether they're even going to build that factory. So when you think about the good that this legislation was supposed to do, revitalize U.S. chip manufacturing, I feel like in some ways it reveals how difficult it is to actually do this. Absolutely. And this comes at a really inconvenient time for both President Biden and for Vice President uh, Kamala Harris. Of course, Arizona is a critical swing state, as is Pennsylvania, in terms of your comments about U.S. Steel. Um, so this is not this is certainly not convenient. I mean, just in terms of the fate, though, of chips, I mean, this is going regardless of who wins. The CHIPS Act is now it is a, it is codified into law. Um, I think that just in general, there is a sense in, in Washington, D.C., that from a national security perspective, um, getting, you know, being not only the the sort of the innovator of advanced chips, but also being the manufacturer of advanced chips is just critical to national security. So almost regardless of what happens with Intel, um, this will be on the books. And I and I would, you know, not be surprised if we don't see kind of more policy making in the semis uh, space, you know, going forward. Right. So, so, regardless, I mean, regardless of what happens. First of all, they also want to build a factory in the great state of Ohio, which I feel compelled <laughs> to be. I, obviously, it's become a Republican state, but uh, could still swing a bit. And the problem is the U.S. government wants to make chips yeah. in the U.S. Obviously, we design them with a number of companies, NVIDIA being the biggest in the world, as Katie pointed out earlier. But um, we need to make, according to our goals, a fifth of the most advanced microprocessors in the world by 2030. We need to make them for the Pentagon. And it doesn't seem like we're going to be able to do that if Intel doesn't have enough money to complete these factories. Yeah, I mean, and again, this is coming at an inconvenient time going into the the election cycle, because to your point, this is something that I think, you know, both sides of the aisle, but particularly President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris sort of were, you know, relishing in that this was, you know, a bipartisan um, legislation that, again, um, you know, from, speaks sort of, sort of to our national security goals. So I think that there is sort of the, the, po the politics here, and then there's the actual kind of business uh, sort of implications. But from a, the sort of the political realm, um, there is just a lot of support for semiconductors. And, for, and, and, and regardless if it makes actually sort of rational sense whether we are actually manufacturing this here, here in the United States, um, there's a lot of bipartisan support for this. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about another hot button issue. Of course, chips is one. Taxes are another. And we have reported also that Kamala Harris is looking to increase the deduction for small business taxes by tenfold. How much does that move the needle in her win, uh, her bid to win more votes? Yeah, look, I think that this, this, this is something we're really underscoring with our clients, that um, tax is going to be 
really sort of the singular focus in Washington, D.C. next year. And I just, I mean, I cannot underscore this, that basically there's going to be a lot of headline risk here as the individual tax cuts um, as part of the, the Trump tax cuts in 2017 all expire at the end of 2025. And the, practically that means that not only are, is going the small business you know, deduction going to be on the table, the corporate rate's going to be on the table, um, that obviously the, the individual rates will be on the table. Uh, carried interest is also going to be uh, in the mix. And so this is going to be, there's going to be a lot of headline risk. I think the, the importance for investors here is though really separating the rhetoric from the reality. Um, and the reality is really going to be predicated on the composition of Congress. So it's not only who's in the White House, but it's you know who, who controls the Senate and who controls the House. You know, our view is that likely a very narrowly divided Congress is the base case. Um, you know, th that, that certainly can change though over the, next, over the next two months. But regardless if it's a Republican sweep or a Democratic sweep, the margins are going to be very narrow. And that is going to necessarily sort of dictate what's in the, in the tax bill. So a long way of saying, I would just gotta take all of this, these sort of headlines around um, what, what, what Vice President Kamala Harris is sort of suggesting, what former President Trump is suggesting on the tax front with a big grain of salt, because this will all be in the mix uh, next, next year. But again, we'll be beholden to the composition of Congress. Let's talk about the debate. I believe your note said something to the tune of it's hard to overstate how yeah. <laughs> important that debate is. Let's try to do that right here, because we're finally going to see Harris and Trump face off against each other next week. You think about the polling up to this point. Harris has a lot of momentum, but it's still a dead heat, and a dead heat is not a runaway win. When you think about how the debate could actually play into the polls, how high are these stakes? Yeah, I would say that this, I mean, this debate is going to be very important. And again, I think the June 27th debate with, with President Biden sort of answered the question that debates actually do matter. <laughs> In fact, they completely can change the face of a race. Um, and this this one is, is particularly important. Um, you know, I think Kamala Harris in many ways is still reintroducing herself or introducing herself to a lot of the, a lot of the electorate. I mean, a lot of folks think that about five to ten percent of the electorate is still persuadable, um, and so this debate, you know, this debate will will matter. Now, um, I think that you know the, the big question is whether can President, former President Trump, really prosecute the case against Kamala Harris? Can he bring this idea of gas and groceries back to the sort of the, the front burner? This is an issue that obviously plagued President Biden. Uh, Vice President Harris has been able to distance herself from that. Uh, so can he kind of prosecute the case? And then you know, sort of um, you know, similarly. Can she distance herself from the Biden record enough, um, you know, while still um, obviously the reality is that she is the vice president uh, for, for President Biden. Um, um, so can she sort of, um, right. you know, distance herself enough from, from Biden um, while still kind of landing some punches mm -hmm. on, on Trump? So I do think it's going to be very important. Again, the, the polling is very close. Right. Our view is this is a complete jump ball. Libby, point. unfortunately, up against the clock. Really great to see you. Of course, that is Libby Cantrell. She is PIMCO's head of U.S. public policy. This is Bloomberg. We are moments away from the start of trading, looking at another down day. This is Bloomberg Open Interest. I'm Matt Miller. Take a look at futures right now off on the S&P about a third of 1%. The Nasdaq futures down about 7 tenths of 1%. And this after the worst day for stocks since August 5th. NVIDIA alone fell 10% yesterday. And that is obviously a huge drag on the market. Here, uh, you, you hear the opening bells, Eastman ringing it down at the New York Stock Exchange, uh, BioMarin ringing at the NASDAQ, and not a pretty day really to ring these bells, unless maybe we get a great jolts number. On the other hand, a good jobs number could mean that the Fed cuts less than maybe market participants want. Let's get over to Katie Greifeld right now for a look at how the indexes are trading in the initial seconds. Well, Katie? it feels like there is a long way between now and Friday. And you take a look at what the majors are doing right now, seconds into the trading day, and that is continued selling pressure. The S&P 500 off by about four-tenths of a percent. We were looking at a 2% decline yesterday. Clearly, there's still sellers in this market. You take a look at the NASDAQ 100 leading losses. Once again, the NASDAQ 100, your big tech names down seven tenths of a percent and small caps. They also had a three percent decline yesterday on the Russell 2000. That index currently off by about four tenths of a percent. And part of the reason things were so ugly was because of Nvidia. We're taking a look at shares this morning after yesterday's nine and a half percent decline, currently down about two percent right now on a deepening anti
antitrust probe into the chipmaker's practices, with sources telling Bloomberg that the DOJ is looking into whether the company may be penalizing buyers that don't exclusively use its AI product, Shanali, uh, another down day for NVIDIA at this moment. Katie, I'm also looking at some movers, big movers, really, after a set of earnings last night, including a security software firm Zscaler, which disappointed Wall Street. Its price target was lowered this morning by Wedbush, Piper Sandler, Jefferies, and Barclays. You now have Zscaler down more than 16% at the market open. Meanwhile, GitLab outperforming expectations as the software company deals with growing competition. You have GitHub really up more than 14% at the open. GitLab, sorry, Matt. Thank you. Uh, companies reporting this morning include Dix, Sporting Goods, which raised its forecast for sales and earnings, as well as Dollar Tree, which faces longer-term challenges as consumers pull back on spending and staying in retail. JW Nordstrom's, the founding family, has offered to buy its namesake department store chain for nearly $4 billion. Uh, but let's get back to the chip stocks, leading the sell-off. For that, we turn to Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. Abby? Yeah, phew. For a moment, I thought you were going to ask me to talk about these retailers. But we are talking about chips, because yesterday was the worst day for for the Sox or that Philadelphia Semiconductor Index uh, down more than 7%, the worst day since March 18th of 2020. That was the degree of the selling power, that fearful selling that we saw in that pandemic bottom. That was yesterday. Today, NVIDIA down, once again, down 2%. Now over the last five days, down about 18%. The worst five days for NVIDIA going back to September of 2022. We'll be taking a look uh, more at NVIDIA in a moment. But take a look at Broadcom, Supermicro Computer, and Intel. Those stocks that are more exposed to AI are down more. So the NVIDIA sell-off really bleeding into the rest of the sector. Let's put it into the perspective of what I was just talking about for that stock. So here was the drop down nearly 8% yesterday, down 7 and 3 quarters percent. Lots of green, lots of red over the last roughly uh, more than four years. But again, this was the type of selling that we saw back in March of 2020. If you remember where it felt like a video game, those types of declines, that was yesterday. And it seemed to come out of nowhere. But again, NVIDIA last week reported a quarter. Yes, it was good. Yes, they guided better than expected, but it wasn't the blowout. In addition, the sequential numbers are down about 50%. So for a stock that had gone so far so fast, at one point on the year, it had been up 180% prior to this congestion area, this massive range. So if we have this big, big drop here, it looks technically, you can draw a, a trend line here. It quite it hasn't hit the trend line yet. Very likely to go sub 100. In fact, very likely to go uh, back where it had been last year, not entirely showing on this chart because it's not a log chart. But anyway, you slice and dice this, Katie. It is painful for NVIDIA. It looks like more declines are ahead, and it's painful overall for the chip space. And it's painful for the broader indices indices as well, of course. You think about the weight of NVIDIA and some of those chip names. Abigail Doolittle, thank you so much. Let's broaden out this conversation now with Bernstein Private uh, Alex Chaloff, he is the chief investment officer. He joins us now. And Alex, at this point, I mean, you could say that it's going to script September. We knew that this was going to be potentially an ugly month if you take a look at seasonal history here. But at this point, what is going to turn around sentiment? What do we need to see when we think about all of the economic data that we have coming up, when we think about corporate America right now? Well, I think you, you hit it first. September is the new October. When I first got into the industry, people said, be careful of October. It's the worst month ever. The last 25 years has shown that it's actually September that has that seasonality and the pullback. Uh, no surprise, frankly, what's gone on the last couple of days. If you look at the selling that happened last week, it was really professional sellers talking to brokers, counterparties, the big desks. They were saying that the professional sellers had really been been de-risking for much of August um, post the Japan stress that happened now about a month ago. And so it didn't take much to have the pullback that we're seeing. This is natural. In some cases, it's needed. You were just showing uh, a stock that's pulling back that's been up 120 percent over the last 12 months. So sometimes it's OK to have this kind of pullback. The, the data that we're looking at, frankly, you're going to get it on Friday. I mean, you're getting hopefully a jobs number that's really a, a, a needle threader um, that that really pops, uh, shows strength in the economy, but not too much strength. Um, 165 is the consensus number, hopefully a little bit higher than that, but not too much higher. 
and, and certainly nothing below. So I don't think you have to wait long. We've got, I don't know, 47 hours until Friday jobs. But and who's I think counting, you might get Alex? something there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think the reason it's important, you know, as journalists here, we are shown to follow the money. And at the end of the day, I think it's important to think about who was really burned in August, how much money is going to be put to work when the opportunities really do arise. How much dry powder is sitting on the corner in order to drive this market meaningfully higher? Well, there's six trillion odd in money markets. And I, I think that if you are in money markets today because you are spending on something in the near term, fine. If you're in money markets today because you're nervous, uh, your return that you've been quoting the last two years that's been terrific, it's about to disappear. Uh, we get the Fed meeting in two weeks. It's highly likely that there's at least a 25 basis point cut, another in November another in December. That's our view. Some in the market are even more optimistic about how much they slice that rate down. So if you're in money markets, enjoy a last clip, your last statement, frame it, because it's about to go away. And that's where the opportunity is to come back into the market, to revisit risk assets of all types, from long duration intermediate bonds, all the way out to equities, all the way out to some private market investments. What kind of equities uh, do you want, Alex? Because it looks like the problem here is that these mega cap tech stocks have maybe run a little too far too fast, at least in the case of NVIDIA, that looks like the issue. Earnings growth is slowing down for the MAG7. Meanwhile, the S&P 493 is finally posting a profit compared to, you know, six quarters in a row of an earnings recession. So do you rotate into those? Well, Matt, if you're rotating now, you might be a little late. We've been talking about the forgotten 493 for a year now. And so thrilled to hear you mention 493. Uh, th there is still an opportunity. There's an opportunity in healthcare. There's an opportunity in staples, um, some non-tech cyclicals. Uh, credit cards are interesting. There's a lot of different areas that uh, are showing profits and have a valuation that are nothing close to, to what you see in tech today. But even still, Alex, I mean, it feels like you have to be so single stock specific in this market because even with that broadening out that we've seen this past earnings season, you haven't necessarily seen those rewards, the fruits of that labor at the index level. I mean, even though maybe some of these small caps, some of these other sectors haven't gone down as much as tech over the past few months, they're still down. So when do you start seeing that sustainably rewarded, that broadening out in earnings power? I think you're starting to see it. I, I'll push back a little bit. There are some names that have done really well outside of tech that have posted profits that are getting the love from the market. I agree with you. It's not everybody. It's not everybody, but that's OK. Um, I, I like the days where there's some broadening out. I don't need the MAG 7 to be awesome five days a week for us to win. And I do think that that placing uh, having an allocation outside of the Magnificent Seven um, or, or some names in there that you think are interesting. Maybe not all of them are interesting, frankly. Um, I think you're going to end up in a much better place a year, two years, three years from now. Some of those names, by the way, are tech and are AI related. You know, a, a lot of the chip makers have run significantly. But what's an interesting opportunity for the next chapter could be those AI infrastructure players, you know, the power generators, the, the cooling agents. A lot of the companies that, that really fuel the AI ecosystem that are the non-chip players, those are still very interesting today. Alex, what about energy? Um, what about materials, uh, consumer discretionary? If I look at you know, a breakdown of the industry groups um, over the last six months or year to date or 12 months, they're, they're at the very bottom. And that's because of the concern about China and I guess the global economy. Um, slowing down. I don't see the slowdown here in the U.S., but there's still big losers. Um, are those bad bets because the economy is still weakening to come, you think? I think some of them just have a different timeline, energy in particular, longer timeline. You've got to really, you're not going to get a short-term pop. It's, it's unlikely that you'll get a short-term pop, but on a long-term basis, it's an interesting way to, to get some diversification. The banks are interesting on the other side of, of what we think the Fed does and the ramifications for commercial real estate and some of the pressures that have been overhanging banks. Man, I think there's a lot of ways to win outside of just the MAG-7. 
Alex, we thank you so much for your time. That is Alex Cheloff of Bernstein Private Wealth Management. Uh, we will be on tender hooks here as we wait over the next 48 hours, as he says, for the next set of economic data. That will make an impact on stocks. And we are going to take a check on stocks right now as well because we are looking at such a choppy trade this week. But the S&P 500 is trying to break into the green. We are looking at it roughly flat on the day, but the NASDAQ 100 still holding on to its losses for the day down about four tenths of one percent after a drawdown just a day ago that was its worst since August 5th and almost a month here. You also have the Russell 2000 still down about two tenths of one percent. Interesting to see the small caps faring worse. Now coming up there are growing questions around when or if Intel will get its hands on 20 billion dollars in incentives from the White House. We're going to bring you details on that story next. This is Bloomberg. All right, it's time now for our top calls. Some of the analyst action in focus this morning. And first up, Evercore ISI defending Amphenol. It's a maker of electrical components after it saw a sell-off yesterday in the wake of that semiconductor route. Evercore says that the AI-linked weakness is overdone and that this stock remains a top pick with sizable upside to Wall Street earnings expectations. Next up, Morgan Stanley upgrading Astera Labs to a buy. The firm sees an attractive entry point and expects multiple tailwinds for the chip infrastructure company, including AI demands. And finally, TD Cowan says that Sweetgreen is a buy and raises its price target to $43. The firm says the company can achieve 5% same store sales growth next year, thanks to a relaunched loyalty service and benefits from the introduction of steak into its menu earlier this year, Matt. Delicious, delicious. All right, we've got uh, breaking news on the Bank of Canada. One of the coolest things about the Bloomberg Terminal is for most central banks, you can just type in Fed Go or BOE Go or BOC Go and get the latest on that central bank's decision. So the Bank of Canada is cutting its policy rate now to 4.25%. Take a look at the loony here and you can see well, not much movement at all. All right, let's move on from Canada. The Biden-Harris administration's big bet on Intel to lead a U.S. chip-making revolution is in trouble as a result of the company's mounting financial struggles. We discuss with Bloomberg Technology co-host Ed Ludlow, also, I would say, an expert on Intel. You've interviewed Pat Gelsinger on a number of occasions, the CEO. Um, is he in trouble, Ed? I mean, are they going to be able to carry out Gelsinger's plans and get their hands on this money from the government? Well, there's a line in the Bloomberg report from last week about Intel's direction to bankers looking at strategic options that Pat Gelsinger is running out of time. But there's frustrations on both sides, right? There's frustrations from Intel, according to our sources, that the Chips Act money they secured, $8.5 billion in grants and about $11 billion in loans, is not forthcoming. Intel wants it sooner. They want access to it. But it comes with strings attached, which basically is uh, proof of work on their manufacturing footprint expansion and vetting. And that's the frustration on the administration or the Commerce Department's side. They made rules about that access to capital. Intel really needs it, but it's also, per our reporting, pulling back on its ambitions because financially it's under duress. Um, and we, we seem to be at a pretty tricky spot right now. And of course, uh, Libby Cantrell from PIMCO was telling us early, earlier about how unfortunate this is for the Biden administration, just when it comes to timing here. But there's been a bevy of bad news when it comes to Intel. This is from Reuters reporting that Broadcom's tests involving sending silicon wafers through Intel's most advanced manufacturing processes failed, Ed. I mean, how big of a setback mm. is that? So what Intel would tell you is that they are actively engaged with, say, a dozen customers who would on paper take advantage of their manufacturing or foundry business. The cutting edge process they have currently is called 18A. The Reuters report says that Broadcom ran a test, they ran silicon wafer through the 18A process and it failed. And the conclusion per the Reuters report that Broadcom reached is that that Intel process is not viable for volume production. The response from an Intel spokesperson in that report was they're still on track for their original timeline. But to join all the stories together, 
Intel needs the CHIPS Act money to ramp up its foundry operations. It also needs third party customers who are genuinely and tangibly revenue generating for them to use that to stem its financial losses. At the same time, they're having trouble proving that that process is going well. And per the reporting of Bloomberg last week, they're having to make tough decisions to scale back, be that strategic decisions like uh, separating out the foundry business or more likely cutting back on existing projects. So how can you go in good faith to the US government and say, we want the CHIPS Act money sooner, but also be sort of looking at your own balance sheet and planning and saying we're going to have to pull back on our manufacturing expansion uh, because of the, the realities of our of our finances. Ed, we thank you so much for your time and your reporting. That is Bloomberg Technology co-host Ed Ludlow. And coming up, the Nordstrom family makes its pitch to buy back the retailer. We're going to have details for you on that deal next. This is Bloomberg. All right, this is Bloomberg Open Interest. Let's take a look at some specific stocks right now. Of course, we have some earnings reports there. We have Dick's Sporting Goods. We have Dollar Tree, uh, both down mightily right now. We know it's been a really difficult time for some of those stores, of course, as consumers pull back here. But then, on the other hand, we have Nordstrom, of course, rising right now, up 1.6% per, right now. Shanali, of course, on some potential M&A news. And Nordstrom is the focus today of our Wall Street beat. We're going to bring in Bloomberg's Crystal Say, who covers deals, joins us now. And she joins us actually from the Goldman Sachs annual retailing conference in New York. I'm sure this is the talk of the town there. And Crystal, before we ask how you see this process going, going to spill out some of the facts of the deal. They've retained Molis and Company. They've said in a statement or a filing, rather, that they are looking for financing, debt financing to complete this deal. And the offer of $23 in cash per share is contingent on that financing as well, as well as a certain amount of shareholder approval here. Of course, this is the founding family of Nordstrom, but $23 is still really the average price of the stock over the last five years and well below the high. How do you think the story plays out, given what we know? So first of all, uh, it's really interesting to look at the department stores. But it really has changed a lot in the past five years. Um, they're, they're quoting this. Um, it's a 34 percent premium compared to uh, their a previous um, uh, whatever period that they looked at. But if you look at the department store, a lot of change in e-commerce, a lot of change uh, in the way that people had shopped. So if you look at the five year horizon, it really wouldn't be too uh, flattering for Nordstrom or for any department store. And like you said, there is a uh, there is a family component here. I think the most interesting thing about this Nordstrom situation is that uh, the consortium, the Nordstrom family and this Mexican department store actually own a combined 43% uh, of the company already. So they're trying to uh, buy whatever that they don't own yet. And like there will be a couple of hurdles, like you said, financing being one of them. Uh, but we will see how this plays out. Well, and um, a poor outlook, as you point out. I mean, I get that the family wants to buy the asset because it's their namesake. Um, they have a huge history here. But can they make money? What do they need to do to improve operations at Nordstrom? Do they need to invest a lot? So there are different ways to run a department store, but a lot of people would say the really, the really, the real turn of the the century really is that people shop online these days. And uh, but then if you don't shop online, you're really valuing the experience. But whatever you're doing, uh, being private, me, it's it's what they think it's a better option. If you look at Saks, uh, which is a private company, they had actually explored things like uh, spinning off their online business and doing, uh, you know, capturing the online valuation versus the offline brick and mortar store, and that allowed them to to do that because you don't have to report quarterly. So this is probably what the Nordstrom family, as you pointed out, the family, the two uh, the two members behind this deal is actually the great grandson of the founding uh, member of Nordstrom. So uh, it has a family heritage there, but they're also looking at being away from the public eye and being able to transform Nordstrom as a company privately. Johan Wilhelm Nordstrom, <laughs> the founder. Change his name then to John W. Nordstrom. Crystal, thank you very much for joining us. Crystal, see there talking to us about this 
potential M&A action. Coming up in the next hour, Nancy Tangler talks chip stocks, Sharon Bell of Goldman Sachs on Euro versus U.S. stocks, and Raymond James CEO Paul Riley is in the C-suite. This is Bloomberg. All right, 20 seconds until Jolts. 30 minutes into the trading day. Welcome to Bloomberg Open Interest. I'm Matt Miller. I'm Shanali Bassett. And I'm Katie Greifeld. And coming up, NVIDIA remains under pressure and it's leading losses in the chip makers. Freedom Capital Market says $100 per share is a key level to watch on NVIDIA. And more key economic data ahead as growth worries resurface. We get the latest Jolts report in just a few moments. Plus, the view from Raymond James will navigate this market environment with CEO Paul Riley as he prepares to hand over the reins. But first, let's get a check on these markets. 30 minutes into the U.S. trading day, you can see we're wiggling back and forth here. The S&P 500 currently down by about three tenths of a percent. We have gotten back to unchanged on that index. No longer those gains wiped out for now, but we know it's been choppy. It's been volatile. We'll keep an eye on that one. You take a look at big tech right now. The Nasdaq 100 down about eight tenths of a percent. A little bit of a bid building in the bond market. The 10-year Treasury yield currently lower by about four to five basis points, Matt. All right, jolts are a big miss. We're looking at 7.67 million job openings. We were expecting 8.1 million job openings. Already would have been a drop from the uh, practically 8.2 that we saw last month. But it does look like the labor market continues to deteriorate. And as a result, we see stocks continuing to fall. Let's get it over to Bloomberg's Michael McKee with the details. Mike? Well, there was a time when we would consider this good news. <laughs> the labor market is loosening up for employers right now. As you mentioned, 7,673,000 job openings in the month of July. But it is uh, down from 7,910,000 on a revised basis. So June's numbers revised down significantly. It's not as big a fall, but it is a significant fall. And it does suggest that we are continuing to see the labor market loosen up. However, the quit rate is still at 1.2 percent. So we're not seeing a uh, 2.1 percent, rather. It, we're not seeing uh, any deterioration in the way people feel about their ability to get a new job, at least not in this data point. Uh, layoffs and discharges changed little during the month, it looks like. So we are not seeing a huge change in the negative side, the denominator side of the unemployment rate. So uh, that's important. We also have some news out now from Rafael Bostic uh, that is timed to this report, perhaps. The Atlanta Fed president, who is a voter this year, saying that uh, he now thinks that it is as important to look at the labor side as it was the uh, inflation side. He says, I've been intensely focused on price stability side of the mandate for the past three plus years. That's changing. Given the circumstances before us, eroding pricing power and a cooling labor market, I've rebalanced my focus toward both sides of the dual mandate for the first time since early 2021. Remember, he had said maybe one cut in December. He started to back off of that. People wondering why. This is his explanation for what he thinks is going to have to happen. I read between the lines there. He's going to vote in favor of 25. A very busy storm of economic data over the next week. We have jobless claims tomorrow. We have CPI a week from now. And, of course, we have jobs on Friday. Mike, we thank you so very much. Of course, the market reacting quite heavily to these numbers. We're going to broaden out the conversation now with Laffer Tangler Investment CEO and CIO Nancy Tangler. And, Nancy, we're going to want to talk to you about some of these big, specific uh, stocks that we're seeing really move the market, NVIDIA being one of them. But before that, just let's ruminate a little bit on this economic data because because if you're seeing ISM come a little weaker than expected, you're seeing uh, the JOLTS number coming in weaker than expected, is the direction of travel starting to influence your thinking more in terms of how you change your wagers? Well, Shanali, thanks so much for having me. Um, 
yes and no. We had been anticipating for months that the labor market was softening. Uh, and I think that's what it's doing. It's not falling off a cliff. I mean, there's still a tremendous amount of available jobs out there, if, if you believe the accuracy of the survey. And I think that that is subject to some interpretation because we know the survey respondents have dropped dramatically uh, in jolt since uh, pre-pandemic. But also the flip side of that is that what we've seen in recent weeks is that the Wall Street Journal did a survey, a consumer survey. We had UMish and the conference board, all of which showed sentiment drifting upward uh, from the consumer, that things seem to be getting better and inflation expectations are anchored, at least from the consumer's perspective. Uh, and then the ISM numbers were miserable. But if we are, in fact, shifting to a more digital economy um, and, and we know that manufacturing is hurt by higher interest rates, then we, we also know that that's not going to improve until we do start to see some relief from the Fed. Uh, but I will point out, I do think the manufacturing sector is, section, sector is super important because of the multiplier effect throughout the rest of the economy. So uh, there's a lot of cross currents, as there have been for the last couple of years. We think the economy is slowing. We think the labor market is slowing. And we have positioned ourselves with uh, a focus on reliable earnings growers because they do well in a slowing environment. And I appreciate the focus on the fundamentals there. You're sorting through, of course, and trying to find the earnings growers. But I want to focus actually on the second-by-second -second trading because I do think it's interesting. You have the S&P 500 wiggling between gains and losses, but you take a look at the bond market, and the direction of travel is clear in the wake of that jolts data. Of course, a big rally building across the curve, especially in the front end. And it feels like it just the bulls in this market really want to see 50 basis points in September from the Fed. And the pricing seems to suggest that it's kind of a toss up right now. And Nancy, even if you, you know, focus on the fundamentals, what do you think that the, the disappointment could look like if the Fed only goes ahead with 25 basis points? Yeah, that's so hard, Katie, because the 50 could look like a panic. And I don't think we're in panic mode. Um, you know, going back, as, as I frequently do, to the 90s uh, for many reasons, <laughs> um, personal and professional. Uh, but, but what you see, is, you know, what you saw then was just two cuts from the Fed in 1995 after aggressive hikes in 1994. And the Fed funds rate lived above 5 percent for most of the decade. So if our productivity theme is correct and it continues, then, then the Fed doesn't need to panic. And so what I worry about is the market, the, the bond vigilantes are trying their best, but they've been pretty wrong relative to what the Fed has ultimately decided to do for the last year. I, I'm not saying the Fed has done the right thing. I think they may have waited too long, um, but we'll see. I, I think we'll get 25 and I think the market will make the adjustment and, and then we'll focus on the election for a few weeks and then and then we'll be back to company earnings. Yeah, the bond vigilantes seem very lazy to me, um, Nancy. I mean, thinking back to the 90s, I don't know if the bond market would have tolerated this kind of deficit spending and, uh, you know, with no fiscal conservatives in sight on either side of the aisle. Do you think that ever becomes a problem? I mean, um, both parties seem to want to spend, 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 and I don't think anyone really cares. Yeah, Matt, I, I have to tell you, I was very disappointed that when um, Fed Chairman Powell at Jackson Hole kind of took a walk down memory lane. And I think there was a bit of revisionist history in there in terms of when they raised and why they raised. But he never once mentioned the impact of just profligate fiscal spending on inflation and the liquidity that is still in the system. Uh, they seem to be ignoring the balance sheet to some extent and the power of quantitative tightening. Uh, so so I'm, I'm very, I mean, I've been disappointed. I, I think Washington will have a comeuppance. Uh, this doesn't continue forever. And we've got Treasury funding at the short end of the curve. Uh, which distorts the bond market. So there's a lot out there that is not normal and I don't think is necessarily sustainable. Nancy, I want to shift gears a little bit here and talk about what we're seeing with NVIDIA and kind of the chips sector writ large, everything tied to AI. So many concerns here about not only valuations, but now regulation risk with the DOJ taking a look at it, NVIDIA's practices, for example. If you take a look at the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index over a five-day period, you actually only have one stock in the green. If you take a look at it over a month, you have zero stocks in the green. What does this mean? Mean about where people are starting to place their AI bets? Is sentiment starting to change? 
Well, I think certainly in the short term, Shanali, I mean, first, let, let's tackle um, valuation. So using NVIDIA as a poster child of technology or chip stocks, um, what you see is a company that will be that grew over 200 percent this year will grow over 200 percent year over year, over 100 percent next year. And it's trading at 35 ten, times next year's earning. The great defensive trade that everyone's talking about, and I, I think it is only a trade, is uh, staples, utilities, REITs. And, and let's use Procter & Gamble as a proxy. That company's growing 12% this year. It's decelerating to 6% next year, and it's trading at 25 next year's earnings. So if we're in a, a slowing economic environment, I want the companies that can deliver earnings growth. We saw deceleration with Microsoft Cloud, uh, and I don't remember the year right now, but it was the cloud was growing at over 90% year over year, and there was all this hand wringing about it's decelerating. It did, and it did not kill the stock price. Of course, it's going to decelerate. And so I think what we have to, to, to determine as investors is what are the long term um, earnings capabilities of these companies. Um, and then on the regulatory side, you know, it, there was a time, and Matt probably remembers this, he claims he's he's as old as, at least was alive in the 90s. I don't believe it, but I did hear him reference Tom Petty recently. True. So there's that. Um, but Intel at one point peaked, the market share peaked at 80%. And we used to joke that, you know, AMD was just kept around from an antitrust standpoint. Well, NVIDIA is at 80%. AMD is a much stronger company. Intel has fallen off the map. Let the market make the decisions. I think the regulatory um, focus is is somewhat misguided. I, I think just because you're an innovator and you're way of, ahead of everyone else doesn't mean that you should get punished by the government. It helps if you're Jensen Wang's cousin as well, as you point out, Nancy. <laughs> Lisa Sue, isn't that crazy? That is wild. It's a small world uh, in, in certain industries, certainly in financial journalism, too. But I am curious, Nancy, I mean, your style of investing, you have your high convictions, uh, usually going with a concentrated portfolio. And even with that, I mean, in a market like this, where the robustness of the uh, economic backdrop is being questioned, whether that soft landing uh, really can be attained, do you hedge in this market? Do you give yourself a, a portfolio buffer here, or do you just have the conviction that your best picks will sort of weather this storm? Um, we've done both. So going into COVID, Katie, we um, you know we didn't know that we were going to have the COVID bear market, but what we couldn't find were really high quality companies at attractive valuations, and so we did put a hedge on the portfolios, and it just happened to work you know extraordinarily well. Um, I'm, I'm going to say that was largely luck. Um, but mostly what we found is if you go back and look at any of these companies, and I think I put it in my notes, um, you know, since IPO, Amazon uh, was, is up over 235%. Microsoft is up 683,000%. I'm sorry, Amazon 235,000%. Um, Starbucks, which we know all the problems that company's had, is right. up 36,000%. Um, and so I think what you have to do is you have to bet on management and you have to focus on, you know, the company's ability to pivot. Intel didn't pivot. Polaroid didn't pivot. Xerox didn't pivot. Sometimes you're going to get it wrong. But mostly what we see are these, these management teams that have gotten and the balance sheets have gotten significantly stronger in a rising interest rate environment because they had a ton of cash on the balance sheet. So they're in a position to pivot X the regulatory problems uh, that may or may not surface. We'll see. Mm. Um, but I do think you, you have to you have to have a longer term time horizon than a, a hedge fund manager if you're not a hedge fund manager because right. they have data that the average retail investor does not have access to. Um, but over the long term, buy and hold for the most part with some adjustments has been the right strategy. And great wealth has been created by just, you know, founders who own one stock. Right. Well, Nancy, it's always great to get your perspective. Really appreciate you taking the time. That, of course, is Nancy Tengler. She is Laffer Tengler Investments CEO and CIO. And, of course, keeping an eye on markets here after we got that jolts data at the top of the hour with U.S. job openings declining to the lowest level since January 2021. Guys, you have to wonder... Does this change the needle for the Fed in two weeks? It was at the lower end of all the estimates, actually lower than every estimate out there, which is a little spooky. And you could see it in the market with the two-year yields now at 3.8, below 3.8%. And actually the swaps market even adjusting pricing now about 109 basis points worth of cuts before the end of the year. It was about 102 basis points uh, at the end of it yesterday. So adjustments happening quickly here, Matt. Yeah, it's still uh, a 
little bit more than one job for every job seeker out there. But to Nancy's point, um, a lot of people don't believe this data. You know, a lot of these jobs may be posted um, just as feelers, just as a balloon and not actually be an open job. Or maybe some of these jobs are posted just not taken down and the companies no longer want to hire anybody. It's a fair point. And I mean, you think about NFP too, there's a lot of questions there, whether the unemployment rate is merely going up because labor supply is increasing with immigration. So a lot of question marks when it comes to the labor market. We're going to continue to keep an eye on that story. But coming up, we'll be speaking to Goldman's Sharon Bell. She says that European stocks have an advantage over U.S. equities. We'll explore why next. This is Bloomberg. Let's get a look now at high interest, what's making headlines around the world. Elon Musk's satellite internet provider Starlink is announcing today it will comply with an order by Brazil's top court to block access to X, or Twitter, as you know it. The company previously told the country's telecom watchdog that it would not comply with the order by the Supreme Court judge, but then its bank accounts got blocked and it said, okay, we'll do it. New Jersey is trying to entice the Philadelphia 76ers to move across the river to a mixed-use complex. New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy and his economic development agency sent the NBA team a letter on Monday detailing the offer, offer after uh, plans to build a new downtown arena in Philadelphia have stalled. The 76ers have said they will seriously consider the option, I believe, to Camden. And it's not easy being a cab driver in New York, obviously. It might be getting even tougher, though. The American Transit Insurance Company, which has been the biggest player in the city's commercial car insurance market, is now insolvent. That means taxi and limo drivers could be facing a significant increase in their insurance premiums. Katie? Well, switching gears here, some investors are turning away from pricey U.S. stocks and looking across the Atlantic for value. Here's what Jim Karen of Morgan Stanley Investment Management told us yesterday. We think that as inflation gets more contained in Europe, that I think that the financial sector can actually start to do a bit better. So that's primarily where we are there. And I think that the valuation, see, as we move from these high PE sectors like tech and things like that, other sectors that are a bit more value oriented and that's Europe. Europe is much more of a value equity market, start to get a little bit more of a shine towards them. And that's why, and that's why we move there. All right, and joining us now to keep the conversation going, we have Goldman Sachs senior European equity strategist, Sharon Bell. And Sharon, of course, joins us from the Goldman Sachs annual retailing conference in New York. So Sharon, I'm taking a look on August 27th, you said that European stocks have an advantage over US peers. And your notes today say that you should buy British. Walk us through the base case here and why you're maybe looking away from the US right now. Yeah, look, I think that the U.S. has got many advantages. It's had stronger growth over time. Um, it's had amazing earnings, particularly by the tech companies, for example. But it now looks very expensive. We know these stocks have gone up uh, very much over the last couple of years. The index trades on uh, well above its sort of 20-year range in terms of valuation. And, of course, super concentrated, too, um, in those tech names. Whereas Europe, you've got more value companies. You've got higher dividend yields. You've got companies buying back shares now. So I I think it's more of a, a value opportunity, I guess I would say. In, in, in the UK specifically, um, it always strikes me at first glance as a little bit crazy to be bullish because of obviously the catastrophe that is, you know, modern day Britain post Brexit. But then I remember that most of the companies listed on the FTSE have an incredible global reach and aren't really dependent on, you know, England's economy. Is that the reason that you like those shares? I, look, I think you're absolutely right. The last eight years or so in the UK have seen very little growth, weak productivity, a lot of political instability as well. Um, uh, whereas I think now we've got a uh, more stable government in the UK. Uh, economic growth momentum has actually picked up a bit in the UK. If anything, it's a little bit stronger than you see in the US at the moment. So I would like, 
UK stocks with some exposure to the UK, that would be the mid caps, the FTSE 250. But I also quite like those big cap companies that you mentioned, the FTSE 100, which is super international. They're buying back shares, they're super value, they pay high dividends. They're also quite defensive. If you look at the uh, correction we had in early August or the one in the last couple of days, actually those big cap UK companies have been very resilient to that. Does it matter? Does the government matter, Sharon? I mean, I feel like you've had more prime ministers than Italy in the last five or ten years. Yeah, I haven't counted, but you might be right. Uh, I think uh, if you look at those FTSE 100 companies, about three quarters of their sales is outside the UK. Um, in fact, if anything, I would say the danger for them is they're big dollar earners and the dollar's been weaker um, recently and the pound has been stronger. So it's an index measured in pounds, but you've got a lot of dollar earners in there. Um, that said, there's not very much tech. Um, in the FTSE 100, I think there's pretty much no tech. So uh, whenever you do see a sell-off in tech or some wobbles there or some vulnerability there, FTSE 100 tends to outperform. It's super international. It's relatively defensive. The companies are making a lot of cash at the moment and they're buying back shares. Sharon, I'm very curious about the composition of the FTSE 100 and the role that certain consumer companies play because what you see in Europe is luxury giants, both with exposure uh, not only around the world but importantly to some key markets like China that are facing slowdowns. If you think about a luxury consumer, there's been this concept for the last few months here that there's a bifurcation, lower income consumers really weakening, the higher end holding up, but do you see the higher end significantly weakening as well? It's a good question. I think the luxury goods companies are obviously by their nature exposed to the higher end consumer, which has typically been stronger everywhere. That being said, the luxury goods companies are also very exposed to China, um, including the aspirational consumer um, in China. And China has been weak um, in recent quarters and there's, there's no sign of that weakness slowing at all. Most of the survey data we're getting out of China suggests it's still extremely weak. The property sector and market still very weak there. So I think that that is something which is definitely hitting the luxury goods companies as well. Um, but if I go back to, the, say, the UK, um, this is an index without really very much in the way of that luxury goods exposure. So you don't have that weakness concern about um, the consumer infiltrating into the higher end, etc. in the UK either. Um, I'd say the index with the most luxury goods exposure is the CAC 40, which is the French index. And Sharon, not to sound like a self-important American, but when we think about your call by British, of course, Europe over the US, what happens if the U.S. actually doesn't achieve a soft landing, if it falls into a downturn? I mean, how, does, how do you factor that risk into your calls for these other markets? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. I mean, normally Europe is quite high beta, meaning that whenever you see a downturn in the U.S., um, you see Europe underperform. Uh, that being said, I think if the U.S. underperforms this time because of maybe a, a weaker economic environment, will Europe also underperform? Yes, I think um, indices like the DAX, the Eurostoxx 50, which tend to be quite cyclical indices, I think they would underperform. But the FTSE 100, which is quite a defensive index, um, it's got lots of healthcare companies, uh, it's got lots of consumer staple companies, for example, which tend to be quite defensive, telecoms, utilities, I think it would tend to outperform. So I think it depends on where you look within Europe. But yes, Europe also, as well, is much cheaper than the US, hasn't performed as well in recent years. So if there's any frothy valuations, it's more likely to be in the US rather than in Europe at the moment. All right, Sharon, thanks so much for joining us. Great to see you on this side of uh, the Atlantic for one. Sharon Thank Bell you. there of Goldman Sachs. I used to talk to her all the time when I was anchoring right. a European market open. I, I forgot that you used to do that. With my buddy Guy Johnson. Nobody else knows the extent of your Europe facts. You they come to us at 6 in the morning every day. Yes. It's a lot. Do you know <laughs> what is absolutely fascinating beyond, I mean, I can't believe that 74% of Germans in Thuringia showed up to vote over the weekend. That's an incredible voter turnout. A fact turnout. you needed to know today. But, no, the uh, <laughs> U.S. Uh, tens twos, or twos tens, I should say, has turned positive now, for only the second time this year. Mm -hmm. It's incredible, and if you think about it, it really goes with that soft landing question we've been having, because there is a lag often. This is the longest inversion I believe we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. We have seen that curve disinvert, particularly on the heels of that JOLTS data. This has been a trade that Wall Street has been levered to. Finally, they're seeing Seeing some payoff here. It's been the heartbreaker. And it's you, been the heartbreaker. You think about the dynamics that finally got us here. It was actually a bull uh, on the way up to disinversion because you have basically the two-year dropping 
more so than the long end because people are finally betting on rate cuts. This is what was supposed to happen. That was the dynamic. This that is bearish. No, this I mean, well, bonds are rallying right now. They are, but are they rallying because uh, they believe that the economy is weakening? That's the problem. Right. Well, just in terms of the actual dynamics, it is a bull move that got us here rather than a bearish, rather than the long end losing control. You have the short end flattening, dropping because people are betting on Fed rate cuts, which is the underpinning of the original call, which just did not work. Either way, people are making money today, but not in the stock market. Yeah, I just think <laughs> it's fascinating that it's been inverted for so long, and we see a disinversion on a day when we have the uh, labor market coming in with a weaker than expected reading in terms of jolts. Coming up next, we speak with Paul Riley. He is the CEO of Raymond James. This is Bloomberg. Let's get a check on these markets because you have an S&P 500 really trying to slip into the green here. Now flat on the day, the Nasdaq 100 maintaining its losses of a little more than one tenth of one percent, though off of session lows. And the 10 year, the bid in the bond market really sustained here about four basis points lower on the day after that JOLTS report. And of course, more jobs data throughout the week. To make sense of these markets with us now is Paul Riley. He is the CEO of Raymond James. Paul is the third CEO in the firm's history and will be passing the lane, the reins here to Paul Shukri while remaining on board as executive chair. And we're going to talk about succession, the future of Raymond James. But we also want to get your thoughts on how clients are reacting to the market environment and some of the big ticket items that are happening here in the world of politics. It is incredible. We have just reported a story on just how much it would cost here to see uh, the Trump tax cuts be maintained, to see just how much it would cost at the end of the day. And according uh, to certain experts that we're citing here, it would cost more than almost all federal agencies. The tax cuts expire at the end of next year. Either president would have to really grapple with this issue. What, in your view, would be the most damaging to investors? What is your staff talking about as they talk to clients? Well, it probably depends. Uh where you fall, you know, in the in the snack brackets here. So, probably the wealthiest investors, the proposed, not just the expiration, which doesn't affect them that much, but some of the proposed uh, tax increases on net worth, unrealized gains, and stuff, really has them concerned. And so, I know people are worried about it, but it's way too early to call the election. It's you know way too early to know what would even pass. You know, whether House or Senate will be divided or not, and you know, what does it take to pass the tax changes? So there's a lot of speculation, but not much to realize, you know, what's really going to go on yet. Yeah, yeah it's interesting because you see the two campaigns taking two different strategies. Yes, that unrealized uh, taxes on capital gains here are something that many investors are concerned about. But then you have uh, Kamala Harris floating that idea about really reducing kind of the tax burden on small businesses. At the end of the day, would you like to see large corporations tax more, small businesses tax less? Where does kind of that tax burden have to come from in corporate America? Yeah, that's that's kind of a hard one because no matter who you pick, someone's not going to be happy in that. So, you know, corporate taxes, I think in general, individual income taxes aren't at an excessive rate. So the question is, uh, can they really go down? Well, you got to fund the deficit, which will continue to increase. So the question is more where you're going to apply some of those savings. Uh, and investors worry about different things. Certainly the estate tax exemption going down. That's a near-term thing when people trying to, you know, want to use that up. So when will they get an indication? Um, the highest rate, you know, going down last time. I personally think that wasn't needed, but there are probably a lot of people that would disagree with me. So again, it's it's a matter of how do you raise the money and who pays. So. I mean, it's just not an obvious thing. Right. I think uh, personally a lot about the state and local tax deduction, right, which w was capped. Trump capped that before um, the election. I could write off my property taxes from my federal. Now I can't. 
And if I had that extra money, I would spend it straight back into the economy, <laughs> every last cent. So yes, it would cost more, according to this accounting, cars, in the future, but it might also boost GDP if people like me put it right back into the economy, right? Well, my question is, I mean, Raymond James has an extensive network of financial advisors. I mean, does that dominate conversations with financial advisors right now, basically those tax questions that uh, Matt is sitting on here? I think people are more focused on what's going to happen in the near-term economy. They're, they're clients. They're talking about what the tax implications can be. But I think, again, it's too early to really focus on it too much. So they're having conversations over cocktails or in a conversation like we're having today. Mm -hmm. But I think they're more worried about where is the economy going, you know, what's going to happen, will rates go down, and those types of things are more dominating the conversation right now with advisors and their clients. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, no cocktails on this set. It's a, little, <laughs> it's a little early, but shifting a bit away from politics here, I mean, when it comes to that financial advisor network, uh, you said recently you have about 8,800 financial advisors as of June 30th. That's up 1% from a year ago. And I'm always curious about the role of financial advisors. Obviously, uh, younger investors are entering the market, millennials, Gen Z. Is the role of the financial advisor shifting? How do they remain relevant? Well, for the last decade, there has been a big shift. A lot of advisors, what I call asset allocators, where should I put my investment dollars? But that's really shifted into being wealth planners. You know, advisors that are successful are integrated so much into the family, people don't realize they're helping families make family decisions, allocations, setting plans and helping people achieve where they want to be, not just performance. It's what are my goals? Am I in a good position to hit my goals? So they've really become integrated into the family. And what everyone said, well, X and Z, they're going to pick their own. We're not seeing that. I take my own six kids so from <laughs> you know, 27 to 40. You know, my, I remember my 40-year-old said, why would I ever invest a dollar in the stock market? It hadn't gone up. Well, she's invested. My kids are invested. They have advisors. Some have their own advisors away from me. Um, but they're all using financial advisors, even though they were the people that were going to make their own decisions. It's too complex. And retail individuals need that push to do things. It's like writing the first will. People are afraid to sign a will because they think they're signing their death certificate or something. You know, people are going to die eventually. It's, it's yes. the financial planning. But just to get people to sign it's hard. To get people well, to stay in the market when it's off is hard, right? And that's their role. It's hugely important. And by the way, good for you for tripling the replacement rate. Um, with six children, uh, because demographics are going the other way, right? I mean, we talked to Sally Krawcheck on this program, and she was talking about the fact that, you know, the, uh, the boomers have like $75 trillion, I think Yardeni gave me that figure, but $75 trillion in wealth that they're going to eventually pass on. Um, you have now, I think, one and a half trillion dollars under management at Ray J. Um, is that going to keep growing as they pass it on? Are they spending it? I mean, how do you, where, where do you see that going? Yeah, I think that certainly when you divide wealth into pieces, probably everyone spends, you get a little more spent, you know, um, just because they have more and it gets divided up. So, but I think it'll continue growing. I mean, do you believe the markets will grow over time? And I, I believe they will. It doesn't mean We've been waiting for this adjustment, right? We've had a 15-year run. When's the last time we've had a really 15-year run in the equity markets? But people have been wait talking about the soft landing for three years, right? Now we're on to the next year. There'll be a correction at some point. But I believe long-term the markets will continue to grow. So those invested their wealth should continue to grow. And if our advisors are doing their job on succession, making sure their kids are involved, bringing next-gen advisors on their teams, which all the good teams do, I think, you know, we'll continue to keep our share of the wealth and have the business grow. Paul, it's been really interesting. If you look at Raymond James's stock over the last 20 years, for example, you've only had three down years, and that includes 2008. So quite the run here. If you look at the next 20 years of Raymond James's growth, where does it come from? Do you see an opportunity to buy assets, to increase in wealth management, uh, an M&A capacity? Where are the biggest growth areas for you? Well, so first, you know, we're long-term growth oriented. Our, the number one growth success of the firm has been retention, less than 1% regretted attrition a year. So it's easier to grow when you're not replacing people that are leaving. Secondly, it's individual recruiting, or organic recruiting. You know, assets are up 50% versus recruited uh, 
this, these in the last nine months versus the previous nine months. So we continue to have success in the marketplace. And when we find acquisition M&A opportunities, if they're a cultural fit, and there probably aren't a lot of firms left that we'd put in that category, you know, we'll execute on them. So we're, we don't force them. They happen when they happen. Uh, but we believe that we can continue to grow, attract advisors. And remember, Raymond James is primarily a, you know, a financial planning firm. So 80% of our revenue directly and indirectly comes from that part of the business. So that's where we're focused on growth, as well as our capital markets businesses and others. Okay, so open to organic M&A, but uh, not going to force it there. You mentioned that, I mean, if you expect that markets are going to continue to grow, then your assets under advisement will continue to grow as well. I'm curious where you think that growth in markets is going to come from, because it's been really interesting watching the IPO market really kind of dry up. And we know that private markets are very hot and only getting hotter. How are you thinking about that dynamic? You know, companies staying public or staying private rather for longer. I mean, you have a lot of teenagers right now when it comes to the private markets. Yeah, it's at some point, generally, those markets only get so big. So the private markets, you see a lot of trading amongst private equity firms. But at some point, they get to a size either there's no other exit, you know, but the public markets today. So sure, there's fewer firms going public because private's easier, you know, less regulation, easier to grow the firm for a lot of reasons. But at some point, they've got to monetize, and that's generally the public market. So. You look at Facebook, how big it went, got before it went public. So I think that's the ultimate exit. So I think the public markets are still going to be active. Um, so you know, I, th I think there's a lot of opportunity. Right now, private equity, because of the amount of money it raised, has certainly been a bigger factor. And it's been a long period of time and has helped grow companies. But we'll have to see. You know, Sometimes they're buying at a lot higher multiples than the public markets are buying at. And, but those can go up and down. We'll see where they balance out over time. Are you concerned about this election? I mean, there are, I guess there are a lot of similarities in, in that both of these parties want to continue to spend as much money as they possibly can and blow up the deficits to unbelievable levels. However, there are differences, right? Um, Trump wants to deport millions, um, you know, stop incoming at the border, continue the tax cuts. I mean, a lot of seemingly inflationary things, um, and we don't know a lot about uh, Kamala Harris's plans. Yes, yeah, so there are a few things we can't control. One are markets, one are regulations, and one are elections. So, you know, we have to work with whatever the result is of all of those. So, certainly the Trump administration <laughs> would reduce regulations. I mean, he wants to gut the civil service. Well, it, it probably, more likely, you know, his campaign has been more likely to do that than the other. But, you know, you have to work within the parameters. And who knows? It seems like everyone in every election that I can remember would speculate if this party got elected, it would be the destruction of you know, the markets and this one would go up. They seem to not matter you know, in the short term anyway. Long term policy does. And the one thing you don't hear anything is about the deficit. I mean, the three campaigns ago, it dominated. Now, no one ever mentions it. You know, and it's, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a bigger and bigger factor well, that we have to deal with at some to, point. To that end, at what point does it actually matter? Because you have not seen the bond market react to it yet, yeah. not, not in a significant way. How do you invest in longer term treasuries if you're really worried about the deficit? Well, it's still a relative, you know, the treasury can always print, right? And it's still the currency of the world. So it's still the safe place to be at least perceived whether it is actually. So I think the Treasury markets are still safe. It's still in demand. You know, the question is, how long do you go before people lose confidence and say, you know, this isn't a good bet. It's too risky. And I don't know what that breaking point is. 10 years ago or 20 years ago, there's no way all these countries could have this much debt. But they do. And they seem to still be, you know, you know, working with all that debt. Paul, you mentioned something earlier about how politics is really something that people are talking about uh, in the course of their everyday lives. But when it comes to the market, they're more worried about the economy. How worried? Um, I would say concerned. You can see that the confidence has gone down slightly, but not materially. I think when they, they see valuations, they hear you know, the economy is slowing, the job growth may be slowing now, and they see the first signs. They're concerned, but not enough to panic or withdraw, right? So when the market's clearly going up and it's you know, going up quickly, then you don't worry about it. But I think it's a reasonable expectation to say, look, it's slowing down. 
what does that mean? What does that mean for my investments? But the truth is, where do you invest? So you got to put your money somewhere. And you know, so again, being diversified isn't so bad because you, you, know, you hedge your bets. All right, Paul, great having you in the studio. Thank you so much for joining us on this new program. Paul Riley there of Raymond James. Let's get a quick check on the markets right now. For that, we go to Bloomberg's Abigail Doodle. Abby? Well, Matt, we're seeing a little bit of a stabilization after yesterday's drop. This is a two-day chart of the NASDAQ 100. So yesterday's 3% uh, fall. That was the worst day going back to July of this year. Underneath, there were some stocks and the chips in particular the worst day since 2020, but pretty decent selling power, as you can see. Today, up and down, right now, up just a little bit. We have this mark for a one-day percent change, up about two tenths of 1% earlier, down a little bit. So let's see where things fall. Beneath the surface, we've got a lot of uh, outsized movers, including GitLab, up 22% right now. This is the best day in more than a year. They put up a good quarter. They boosted the forecast. Uh, analysts really liking the results out of this application software company. Tesla up 4.4%, uh, it seems like some folks buying the dip there. NVIDIA turning into the green. This, of course, uh, into today, the prior four days, the worst uh, going back to 2022, a 16% drop. Let's see whether or not it can hang on to those gains. Technically, this one really does seem like it's going back below 100 once again. And then Dollar Tree, a big, big, not even lagger, just plunger, down nearly 20%, the worst date since 2001, bad quarter forecast, uh, and saying that the consumer, that their lower income consumer, that they're really not showing up. Now, all of this has the VIX elevated because, of course, uh, we have seen a return to volatility so far in September, and September generally are more volatile. What we're looking at here is the VIX curve. Up top, uh, it is October, November, and then December really to show the elevated VIX through the year around the election time, closer to an 18 handle. But what I want to point out is we're now in backward Asian. We have the spot VIX going up to, it had been closer to 21, now at a 20. But when you have the current uh, future higher than the future futures, that's a little bit backwards. That's probably why it's called backwardation. Let's see whether or not this VIX retreats back down as uh, investors become a little bit less uncertain. Or, Katie, if we see it continue to go higher, if the chips that sell off that we saw yesterday, if there's more room to run there. All right, Abigail Doolittle, thank you so much. And of course, as we continue to keep an eye on that yen carry trade unwind, here's a headline for you. Japan's yen strengthening 1% to 144 per dollar. That's in the aftermath of that jolt data that we got at the top of the hour. Remember, in July, early July, we were in the 160s. So clearly, of course, the yen really strengthening, rallying against the dollar, and that is continuing now. Now coming up, Howard Lutnick helping to boost SPACs to the industry's biggest month in two years. We'll have the details next. This is Bloomberg. the blank check market just had its best month since 2022. The boom was boosted by a mix of new and experienced sponsors pricing new deals with more expected to come. Joining us now is Bailey Lipschultz, who covers SPACs and everything else for Bloomberg News. So what is behind the little bit of the revival that we're seeing in the SPAC space? Because that felt like a bull market phenomenon. It was. In 2020 and 2021, it seemed like we had hundreds of deals pricing. And Katie, now it seems like these sponsors are returning. So some seasoned, better, uh, seasoned sponsors, Howard Lutnick, they've priced at least nine vehicles. Avi Katz's uh, gig capital has uh, raised at least five. The big thing with this kind of revival is the expectation that we're going to see a rush to go public next year. So if you're a smaller company, if you're maybe a tougher story to tell, maybe you can't get Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley done right your IPO, well, a SPAC is another route. So that is kind of what's driving at least the boomlet that we've seen in June, July, and August. It's interesting because that is Cantor's story, that they want to work with small and mid-sized companies, tend to have a tougher story to get to profitability. How big is this rebound? Let's talk about numbers here because really it's only about 100 checks looking for deals versus around 600 at its height, I believe you reported. Yeah, more than 600 back in uh, 2021 when everyone was getting out of the door. So $2.1 billion being raised in August, busiest month since 2020, uh, 2022, excuse me. But when you look back to December 2021, we saw north of $10 billion. So this is one fifth of that level. And we're seeing, again, smaller check sizes. So these are $100, $200, $300 million, whereas Bill Ackman
Jackman went out and raised $4 billion and was ultimately unsuccessful. Again, kind of going back to smaller companies, smaller targets, those that can't right. go the traditional IPO. Well, route. I mean, Katie's point about IPOs being hindered by the rise in private investment is a good one. We've also heard that people just prefer putting money into giant mega cap stocks. And if they're not doing that, as we see, you know, NVIDIA um, lose hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars in market cap, maybe they're putting their money instead in these SPACs and eventually IPOs. Well, the big thing with the SPAC market is that you're raising cash. You can easily redeem it. If you're a savvy investor, it's totally risk-free. It's essentially investing in T-bills. So there is that protection and there is kind of the, again, the route for maybe getting someone else to buy into a story. The whole argument for going public via SPAC is you have eight, nine, ten months to hit the road and talk about your story. Whereas with a traditional IPO, you're on the road for about a week. And maybe if you're one of 15 companies in a busier stretch, maybe it's going to be struggle. You're going to struggle to get the T rows or the Black Rocks to want to sit down with you. Right. In some ways, super easy money, easy to raise the money, hold it in the SPAC structure, harder to spend the money at, into a deal. Bailey, thank you so much for keeping an eye on this market for us. We're also going to turn an eye here to hedge fund returns because they're starting to flow in for August and boy are they interesting because after the August route you do see the biggest multi-strategy hedge funds just holding on to gains but really kind of marginally walleye is up the most of the pack of the multi-strats at 3.4 percent with 0.72 up 1.6 percent so pretty lackluster returns across the board Citadel's main Wellington fund here up one percent Schoenfeld the same but beyond that you're not getting gains of even one percent after some having double digit returns year to date what we're not seeing yet which I am dying to get my eyes right. on right. is the Tiger Cubs because that's where we think we might see some more pain given the tech heaviness of those funds. So we'll continue to keep an eye out for that. I just want to say you have all these big brains in these hedge funds. The S&P 500 I was, just gonna say the same was thing. up 2.3% in didn't even beat the Well, in year to date, it's up more than 16%. I mean, not a single one of those hedge funds no. has come close it's to amazing. the S&P returns. It's I don't just know how amazing. Boaz did with all that tail risk <laughs> in October, on August. All right, coming up, the market moving events that you need to be watching, and there are a lot of big ones to come. Even though we're halfway through the week, we're going to continue watching the jobs market. That's next in our trading diary. This is Bloomberg. We promised you the trading diary, and now we're going to give it to you. This is what you need to be watching in the remainder of the week. The Fed will release its beige book at 2 p.m. this afternoon after we got those Bostic heads. Um, maybe it'll still be interesting. Tomorrow we get the ISM services data for August. But more importantly, we get initial jobless claims, one of the most important pieces of economic uh, information that investors need, the most important being the non-farm payrolls. And that comes on Friday. That's it for this program.